1781, a young American nation struggles for its independence from the British on the battlefields of Virginia. France's assistance is crucial. The Marquis de Lafayette troops provide reinforcements, money, engineers, and even tricolor uniforms to the young army. In 1941, in the same part of the United States, hundreds of soldiers of the 116th Infantry Regiment, aged 15 to 19, are called to serve their nation. They leave their farms and villages in Virginia to come to France's rescue. On a cold June morning in 1944, these young men, filled with hopes and dreams, lay down their lives on a beach in Normandy. Sixty years later, do students at Liberty High School in Bedford understand the sacrifice of their grandparents and their friends? Or has too much time passed? Six decades after their elders landed at Normandy, Virginia's young men of the 116th Regiment are being called to serve their nation again but this time, a different destination awaits them. They're leaving for Iraq. I'm not really a very aggressive person, but I feel that it helps me vent sometimes. And uh, there's something satisfying about beating people up, I guess. <laughs> uh, you work so hard during the week. Uh, coach is running your butt off, uh, drilling you left and right, and then you get your hand thrown up and you won. probably going to end up going into the uh, Army National Guard and uh, this is a great way to get in shape for that and get ready for that and it just really helps you out for that I guess. I uh, signed up to go into the Marine Reserves and stuff. Uh, I leave for boot camp July 19th for actually the reason I'm doing this is for money for college and stuff uh, to better prepare myself for the future. So, Honestly if the, the time came I think I'd feel more compelled to uh, participate in a war if it was on American soil. You know, then I would, I'd be 100% for it. But it would take a pretty big undertaking for me to go to a foreign war. Uh, yeah, I would, I'd volunteer because it's uh, to serve the country and everything. It's one of the best things you could do. It's pretty rewarding to go out there and serve your country. War is just, should be used as a far last resort. It's a terrible thing and it should never come to that. There are other ways to solve problems. And I don't know, I, I would rather not kill people. I just feel that you know, there's something immoral about that. The young man in the photograph is named Bob Slaughter. When the photo was taken, his homeland was going into war. Bob's life was about to be turned upside down. John Robert Slaughter is born in 1925 in Roanoke in the south of Virginia. In 1940, times are tough. The country is just pulling itself out of the Great Depression. Bob is 15 and begs his father to sign the papers so he can join the National Guard and earn some pocket money. He goes to school during the week and spends his weekends at the armory, making a dollar a day performing military drills. 
my father was in World War One, and uh, he probably knew a whole lot more than I did. I didn't join the service to go to war. I went join joined because of the dollar a day, you know, that uh, was spent spending money, and I I begged them that you know we needed uh, the extra money that I would would get and. Uh, so they did finally sign, and I, uh, you know, to go in to the Master Guard. That seemingly harmless decision would weigh heavily on him for the rest of his life. On the morning of December 7, 1941, a swarm of Japanese planes unexpectedly attacked the American military base at Pearl Harbor. The American public is shocked. The United States enters full force into the Second World War. Because of their membership in the National Guard, hundreds of young men from Bedford, Lynchburg, and Roanoke leave their schools and sports fields for boot camp. Like them, Bob is automatically transferred to the 116th Infantry Regiment of the 29th Division. After a year of training in North Carolina and Florida, where he learns maneuvers and weapons handling, the young soldier, Bob Slaughter, is shipped off to Europe. On the 26th of September, 1942, he sets off with almost 10,000 soldiers from the 29th Division aboard the Queen Mary, an ocean liner meant to hold, at most, 3,000 passengers. Bob is only 17 when he watches with a heavy heart as the Statue of Liberty fades into the distance. That was the last time many of these men would ever see the United States again. What a nostalgic and what a, a sunken feeling I had in the pit of my stomach when I you know, knew that we were going overseas and uh, to what we didn't know. We didn't have any idea what we were going to do, but. I, I couldn't believe I couldn't believe that we were going into combat. I just didn't think we were good enough, and I didn't think our unit was uh, up to up to standards to uh, to go to war. The crossing of the Queen Mary ends with a tragedy off the Scottish coast. By accident. The enormous ocean liner collides with the ship escorting it to port and splits the ship in half. 332 British sailors are killed, leaving not a single survivor aboard. Bob first trains in Scotland with the Rangers. Then he goes to the south of England, where thousands of his countrymen have spent several months relentlessly preparing in utmost secrecy on the beaches of Devon. These beaches resemble those of Normandy where a gigantic landing of American troops is being planned in the areas codenamed Utah and Omaha. According to the strategy of the Allied forces, under the guidance of General Eisenhower, the coast and the German defenses will be shelled by the Air Force, the Navy, and by mortars installed on flat-bottom barges. Amphibious assault tanks will land first, shelling the length of the beach to create foxholes. The troops will arrive next and use the foxholes to shield themselves from German gunfire. Yeah. 
On the 5th of June, 1944, after a 24-hour postponement because of a storm on the English Channel, three and a half million soldiers are assembled on the southern coast of England. Each loaded down with at least 55 pounds of equipment, the soldiers that will take part in the first waves of assault set aboard an incredible armada. Operation Overlord is the largest coastal invasion ever conceived. It mobilizes 1,300 warships, 4,000 landing crafts, 177,000 vehicles, and 500,000 tons of ammunition and supplies. Bob is 20 years old. He is part of the first waves to land on the western part of the long beach of Virville Colville, codenamed Omaha Beach. We had no idea what we were getting into. I was excited about it. I, I really wanted to go. I mean, we thought the quicker we, you know, win the war, the quicker we go home. And I wanted to go home. I was homesick. Normandy was one of the uh, big spots that was required to have to win the war. I just know that it was, uh, it was a beach in Normandy where there was a pretty important battle that happened. It, I think it was like a, it was a great turning point in the war. I'm trying to remember all my history from 10th grade. You know, I'm not, I'm not really sure what the goal was. I guess it was just to take back land that had been taken by the Germans. At five in the morning, by the first lights of dawn, the English Channel is covered with ships and the skies are filled with planes. The longest day begins, and with it, the long march of Bob Slaughter. It got cold and wet. The wind was blowing, of course, and this was June, but it was cold. And I'm, let, me, let me tell you, it was at least probably in the 40s and the wind blowing, and, and, and I was just shivering. I took my helmet off, and I vomited into my helmet, and there was water, about a six inches of water in the bottom of the boat, and I would wash it out and throw it out. And then I'd vomit some more, and that's the way I went 12 miles and about three or four hours of just heaving and heaving and heaving until everything was up. And everybody was sick. I mean, you could smell the sour smell of that, uh, of everybody getting sick on that landing craft. did was because they started dropping mortar shells. I could see the pattern. It was, uh, they were hitting right at the water's edge. And I knew that if you stayed there, you're gonna get killed. And so I got up and started running as hard as I could go. I still don't understand how we made it. I really don't, that's, uh, that's a mystery. How we got across the beach without getting killed.
Bob is an exception. There are few soldiers from the first waves that came out unscathed. The combat at Omaha Beach turned out to be the bloodiest of D-Day and the Allied command's biggest strategic mistake. Because of the fog, the aerial bombardments missed the German positions. A turbulent sea sank nearly all the floating tanks. The American soldiers found themselves without cover in the face of heavy fire from the Germans. In several hours, 2,500 young Americans lost their lives at Omaha Beach. It was impossible to help the scores of injured soldiers who were swept out to sea by the rising tide. Hundreds of teenage boys were disfigured, crippled, scarred for life. On June 6, 1944, the Bedford boys were in the front lines, and within hours, 23 among them would be dead. Considering Bedford's population, no other town in the United States knew such a loss. Of the 2,500 killed, 790 came from Virginia, the state that paid the highest toll. Bob counts among the dead many soldiers of his regiment, including local schoolmates with whom he shared many carefree moments. The nightmarish vision of this beach strewn with dead and wounded would haunt him throughout his life. the star um, was given to me for Christmas from my mother-in-law and it represents that we have a family member in Iraq and um, Ray has been there it'll be a year the 28th of March US forces in Baghdad are gearing up to answer this with more of this Baghdad's top commander says they're targeting a new enemy with Operation Iron Promise. U.S. officials say the enemy in Iraq has three faces. Saddam loyalists, local extremist religious and political groups, and foreign-led terrorists. Last fall, Saddam loyalists were the deadliest, but U.S. forces believe most of them are now on the run after months of intensive American raids and arrests. So next on the hit list are Iraqi extremist groups. U.S. intelligence believes these local radicals are providing some funding and aid to foreign terrorists who make up the third group on the U.S. hit list. I just want to pray for Ray as he is over in Iraq and, uh, and for his whole company as well. I just pray that you would uh, bless his food to our bodies and keep him safe and uh, just give us a great day. I just want to pray. Amen. Amen. I don't know, I'm retired military, and my oldest son's there, and uh, I feel it's our, our country's duty to be there. And, you know, we need to support our government when, when we are, have decided to go over to help a country, we need to support the government. I can't be so, I, w I wouldn't jump up in the air and go, ooh, pick me, pick me, because I'm, I'm not all for the war type deal. It's just, it's not my character. But if, if we, if, you know, if our, our nation or if our country was in dire emergency of young men who, were, who had somewhat of an ability to be a soldier, I would, I would go. But where I'm heading, I'm heading into the ministry, hoping to become a youth pastor. And going into the ministry and then going into the service, it's two different extreme positions to be in. I'm not going to voluntarily put myself in that position just yet. <laughs> so. There's been um, times um, that he, he has told me about that wasn't so pleasant. Um, when he has to go and, and retrieve other soldiers that weren't so fortunate. And that's the downside of it all. You know, it was having to, to go get people. And I don't know how he deals with that. He, he hasn't really elaborated on it or talked about it a lot on his emotions, you know. But 
he's a peppy person. He likes to joke and carry on and play around. And I was hoping, I'm hoping that the Army does not, or, or being in Iraq, does not take all of that out of him because it wouldn't be Ray if, if he wasn't the, the laughing, happy type. It, it just wouldn't be him. We helped the French at Normandy, and here we are trying to fight this war in Iraq, and we don't have uh, their support as we did. We had a, as uh, we supported them in World War II. Um, um, so I, it, not so much resentment, just it was a disappointment probably to a lot of Americans um, because we, we supported them in World War II, but they didn't come, you know, go to Iraq and help us. fighting that I was in happened after D-Day. At St. Lowe and Veer and, and other places where uh, many, many, many of our soldiers were killed and wounded. about 1,500 men, and this morning when the regiment lined up, it, it was probably maybe 200, 200, 300. And these guys were so beat up and ragged that you wouldn't believe. They were all limping and bleeding and wounded, and the ones that were left had been through, you wouldn't believe. Uh, it's hard. Another question? Division was really three divisions by the time we took St. Lowe. One, of, one division in the field, one in a hospital, and another division in the cemetery. We'd get replacements, and uh, before the replacements could get, uh, could get their bearings <coughs> or know what was going on, they were wounded or killed. It was just difficult to uh, and you didn't want to make friends with a, with a replacement because you know he wasn't going to be there more than two or three days. You don't want to grieve every time somebody gets killed, so you just don't, you don't make friends with them. And that's not right, but that's the way it was. Human race, I guess, are just warlike. They love to fight. And they make it so glamorous looking on TV and on, in the movies that uh, people think it's, uh, it's glamour and it's heroic and wonderful. It's not. It's terrible. You need to go, uh, anybody just needs about uh, 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 half a day of combat. That'd be, all, that'd be enough. And you'd never, want, you'd never want to see it anymore. In July 1945, Bob is discharged. He comes back to Virginia several months before the other soldiers. He withdraws into himself and has trouble readjusting to civilian life. 
For several decades, he keeps silent on what he experienced in Normandy. I did try to talk about it at first, when I first got back, and people didn't understand what I was talking about. They couldn't understand. It was just, uh, I couldn't articulate it very well either, I, I, evidently. And it was so hard for me to try to explain what it was like. In 1947, Bob meets a young bank teller named Margaret, and he asks her to marry him. Their marriage helps him recover and gives him a second chance at life. But what career opportunities exist in Roanoke, the town Bob left at 16? He goes back to school and finds work as a printer's composing room apprentice at the Roanoke World News. He had nightmares, terrible, and he still has nightmares. Certainly not as uh, bad as they were when uh, we were first married. He had them all the time. Bob didn't talk about it to any of his family. I, I think uh, when he started talking about it was when his uh, company, D Company, started having reunions, and then the uh, men who all experienced the same things that he experienced, they could talk about, it, about those uh, experiences together. With the passing years, Bob is promoted and on several occasions ventures into the newsroom, suggesting that an article be written to commemorate the 40th or 45th anniversary of the D-Day landing. Each time, his idea is politely rejected. Uh, 15, 20 years ago, D-Day was forgotten. The veterans were reluctant to talk about it, and the uh, school children weren't taught in school. In 1987, after retiring, Bob is sitting on his patio with an old colleague who is telling him about a trip he had just taken to Normandy. Bob realizes the need to build a memorial to honor his friends who died at Omaha. With other veterans, he creates a committee and files requests in numerous locations to get a spot. People here wouldn't give us the spot that we wanted. They offered us little two-acre plots here and there that were you know, uh, next to a railroad track, it was, you know, it wasn't sacred enough to, you know, to give us a, a decent place. Bob sets his eye on a wonderful site on Mill Mountain overlooking Roanoke. But his attempt there is refused, leaving Bob angry. Thousands of World War II veterans pass away every year. He wants his memorial. I wasn't worried about my recognition. I was worried about D-Day's recognition and the men that died, you know, fighting for all of us. They're the ones that I, want, I was concerned about. When I got uh, the opportunity to walk on the beach with President Clinton, that's when I became a celebrity and people started uh, calling me from all over. And In a brief prayer, in honor of the US men who Based on his here, spoken accounts of the war, Bob is invited, along with a dozen other veterans, to accompany President Clinton to Omaha Beach on June 6, 1994, for the 50th anniversary of the landing. Bob becomes a champion for the soldiers who lost their lives on D-Day. wants to stroll up and down this beach to get a flavor of what it was like when 50 years ago amphibious landing assault vehicles came ashore, the Germans were more than ready for them, and some of the bloodiest fighting of the war occurred right here. But when we got back home, there was a big sign in my front yard, 
Well, uh, thank you, Bob. Guy up the street uh, had a, all the neighbors were standing in the yard when I came from the airport. I'd been over there for ten days, you know. From then on, D. Day Memorial was uh, was easy. I mean, people were opening up their pocketbooks and they wanted to uh, be a part of it, and dimes and pennies and donate it to the D. Day Memorial. Bob's dream is realized. He can finally have a monument constructed to honor the memory of his lost friends. The city of Bedford offers the land. The first National D-Day Memorial in America is built entirely from private donations, receiving no government funding. The memorial is inaugurated with great festivities on the 6th of June, 2001, by President George W. Bush. presence here 57 years removed from that event gives testimony to how much was gained and how much was lost. What was gained that first day was a beach and then a village and then a country. And in time all of Western Europe would be freed from fascism and its armies. What I learned was how pitifully weak this country was when World War II began on uh, September the 1st, 1939. We were 16th in the world. Our, our army was 16th in the world. 160,000 men was all of the army we had. Okay? All right. Um, who do you feel the... Uh who were the heroes of D-Day, and do you feel like you were a hero yourself? No, I was not a hero. Uh, the heroes are the ones that are still over there, the ones that sacrificed so much. They gave it all. And there were, there were heroes that lost limbs and uh, are maimed for life and suffered, and most of them have already died now. Uh, you have to say they're heroes. The ones that got back, got through it all, like me, and I didn't have any repercussions. I didn't have any problems with alcohol or drugs or anything like that. So I feel like that I, I really, it's up to me now to educate you guys and to tell you what it's like so we can never have another one. I just wanted to know, uh, what do you think about the, the troops that are fighting over in Iraq today as compared to the troops that fought in D-Day as like their attitude towards war? War has to be the last resort. You try everything that you can before you start sending our young people overseas. That's my, my opinion. I'm not, I don't believe we exhausted all of our avenues before we sent our army over. Okay. Was Bob Slaughter able to get his message across? Do they fully understand the importance of what happened on D-Day?
one of the main things that I wanted to get out of today was to uh, to know what it was like for him over there as a soldier. Uh, if I remember correctly, he said that they were uh, actually in the boats, getting ready to go on the beach at 7 o'clock. I mean, um, I get up at 7, getting ready to go to school, and they were already getting shot at at 7 o'clock. I learn something every time somebody tells me about history. I've learned about D-Day for years, and today, just little things just brought it all together. It made it seem real and at the same time terrifying. I mean, I can't picture myself in, in that kind of situation, much less what I would do. There's a lot of kids who don't even say the pledge anymore, and that, personally, that bothers me, because um, my dad was in the Coast Guard, my brother's in the Coast Guard, my brother's in Iraq, and you know, I, 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 say, to, I say to pledge with boldness, because I know what it means to honor that flag. Um, so I was hoping that most people would come away today with a greater respect for their country and their flag and, and veterans in the past years. And uh, I, I just thought it was a great opportunity today. In my opinion, history is the most important class in school. It, it always has ended up repeating itself, especially those who never learn it. But um, I'm glad to know that <laughs> we in America uh, respect history it, as far as in this school. I'm, I'm glad to learn history, especially this way to have someone come and a personal experience tell us what it was like. The meaning of D-Day, the what D-Day was all about, I, I think that even adults don't really have a great grasp on exactly what D-Day was about. Uh, I think people understand it was an invasion I think that people understand that we were in a war, we were fighting the Nazis, and that I'm not even sure that a lot of people could tell you where the D-Day landings were, that they would actually be able to say, oh, well, that was in Normandy, France. The students tend to see history as the throwaway course. It's the last course that they'll do their homework for. It's the course that they'll spend the least amount of time with. Uh, they're really big in math, really big in sciences, um, English, because those are skills. Those are things that they see as being skills that they'll need in order to make a get a job, make some money, and be able to be successful. But the level of knowledge of American high school students, if you based it on testing, would be very low. You need to be uh, fast-paced and you need to be changing up constantly as you teach the subject. If you can get their attention and grab it, uh, you can get them to think about it for about 10 to 15 minutes. And then this guy walks up to him and as the president's walking through the crowd, shaking hands, shaking hands. The gun comes down out of the sleeve, it's a derringer. That close, blam, let's the president out. <laughs> All right? And it takes 30 days. He shot the guy, it took him 30 days to die, but that's what happened to William McKinley. He was the president. That's what happened to him. And the rea what is that about? That's a reaction to American imperialism. By showing a student how an action of the government or a particular thing that's going on in the current world situation can be related back to events of the past and the way that people solve those problems. Now you can open the door up so that the student can say, well, that's the decision those people made. And now this is the decision that we're facing. Now, can we learn from the decision that was made in the past? Do we go through the same door or do we take a different door? M Mr. Slaughter brought up yesterday the idea that one of the things about America between World War I and World War II was that we allowed ourselves to become weak, that we became isolationists, that we had withdrawn from the greater world community, and that we had reduced our military, and that out of that weakness, 
we actually end up with a greater situation, a more well, terrible situation. What we do impacts them. What they do impacts us. We don't want to believe it sometimes, but it's a fact. Things happen and we have instant, you go home and you can watch a revolution. Uh, if you've been watching TV for the last two weeks, you've seen it in Egypt. If you've been watching TV for the last year, you've seen it in Iraq. So our history is their history. What we want them to learn from that is that you need to be aware of what goes on in the rest of the world. You cannot be, as Mr. Jenkins sometimes likes to say, the ostrich with his head in the sand. You have to be aware of what's going on in the world, and we have to be ready. Wanzuak is where the German bunkers, basically this is the one place where they left everything intact. The barbed wire fences, the craters um, from the bombings, the bunkers, and I'll pass this around so you can kind of um, look through and see. Um, but it's really kind of a, a, an incredible place, knowing what has happened, what has taken place there, being an 18-year-old, um, you know, and, and again, seeing your buddies falling off the cliffs as you're climbing up because you know you have to get the top and overpower the German bunker, that kind of thing. Um, you know, is, is pretty scary, especially when you see your friends. How many of you would keep going? Um, you keep going because you really have nowhere else to go except in the water. It's nice. Liberty High School's French teacher, Julie Mayhew, brings two groups of high school students to Normandy in June and July of 2004 for the 60th anniversary of D-Day. Daniel is excited by the idea of the trip. His parents are too, who volunteered to chaperone the students. Daniel and his parents prepare for their trip. They read up on the places they'll be visiting. Omaha Beach, of course, but also Puente Hawk and Calm Memorial. Uh, Normandy was uh, it's just a fascinating place because of the, you know, the, the scope of the invasion that was there. So it's hard to see and hard to, to tell, you know, just off of photographs and newsreels and stuff like that that you see. Uh, but being there will be uh, uh, an experience that, you know, will be overwhelming. I mean, as a family, we've always, we watch the news and then we discuss political issues a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess it's just carried over into my life. And sitting in government class or history class is just very interesting to me. We talk a lot, you know, it's good to have a discussion with your, with your kids and have, have them understand and you understand what, what they feel like. It's not like you know, I'm, I'm telling them what to do or anything like that. It's a, it's a friendly type of atmosphere. It would be hard for me to have been a mother in 1944 and sent my boys uh, to Normandy. However, the circumstances are far different. Um, and I think the decision to choose to risk your life, that, that weighs very heavily on what the circumstances are. The French position was one of, let's take some time and let's look at this situation. And, you know, we would be willing to build a coalition. And that made sense to me, uh, to, to go in in a position of strength uh, with allied support instead of going in as a personal vendetta. Personally, I was a little bit upset when the French uh, did not go along with the United States on this Bosnia situation in the Iraqi war. But uh, I understand how the French, what they're, how, what they're coming from. They've had two world wars to fight on their soil. And they've uh, they've caught hell, and uh, it's been a it's been a terrible time for uh, the generation, uh, my generation of French. The journey to hell was nightmare filled. Our faces salty and strained. 
sailing into a battle from the sea was not too clearly explained. We pea green infantrymen, though extraordinarily skilled, many of our guys froze traumatized, seeing buddies maimed and killed. That unlucky Mines telegram, water were tied oh so poles, dread, just beneath the we surf, regret to inform your son is dead, to ignite, died for country much too young. Can't you see didn't leave enough heroes left in Normandy? Son. Under crosses and stars, lined up in rows, more? all just plain G.I. Joes. Over a half a century has sped by. Mines in the water were tied to poles, just beneath the surf, went to war. lying, waiting Saved to ignite, to blow us from this earth. It was a new dawn forever that broke upon that day. As on the sands of Normandy and France so far away Teenage boys, they went to war To save our homes and so much more The 6th of June in 1944 A new dawn forever, There's no debate that war is hell and that we should find a way to, to uh, settle our differences without going the military way. Uh, I'm sure that any veteran of World War II and especially those of us who have seen combat do not wish to have our next generation to have to go and do what we had to do. That is uh, essential that we find a way to keep from doing that. 